Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast is number 1401. The topic is training and the title is Compound vs. Isolation Movements. So we're going to talk a little bit about these two. Uh, what are they? Compound movements are exercises that use multiple mu- muscles, multiple joints. Whereas isolation exercises are trying to use like singular muscle or like a singular joint. So one of the ways to think of, think of it is a back row, like a cable seated back row or dumbbell rows. You're using a lot of muscles. You're bending like you're using your shoulder joint. You're using your elbow joint. You're using kind of all of the muscles of the back. You're also going to be using like the back side of your shoulders. Your deltoids are a fancy word for your shoulders. You're going to use the rear part of your deltoid. We actually have three parts to our shoulder. So you're going to use the back side of that. And you're going to use a lot of your biceps. So even though you'd be doing a back row correctly... Like, no matter how correct you do a back row, you're still going to use the rear delts and you're still going to use the biceps. Now, that can be a good thing, but that's a, an a exercise example where you're using multiple muscles, multiple joints. Another example would be, say, a squat. You know, you're, you're bending and moving through the ankle, through the knee, through the hip. Your, your upper body, if you're doing a barbell squat, is involved in it. There's a lot of muscles, a lot of joints. Whereas in isolation, you know, compared to a squat, it could be like a leg extension. You're just moving through your knee. Compared to a back row, it could be like maybe a bicep curl where you're just moving through your elbow. So a compound movement, multiple muscles, multiple joints, and you typically move heavier weight loads. And then isolation exercises are singular muscles, singular joints, and you typically use lighter weight loads than compared to what you could do for a compound movement. So why are we talking about this? Well, I was in a discussion with one of my uh, trainers that I coach, and we were talking about uh, their programming that they're using for two of their clients. And they had kind of like, we just started working together, uh, I think roughly about almost two months ago, been a little over a month. Uh, and they had come from, uh, a system of coaching. They, they were part of a gym where you would do like group classes, but it was for like athletes and experienced people, but it was still like kind of group classes. And they were taught to use, you know, structure X, Y, Z for every workout they ever coached. Now they've transitioned into uh, one-on-one coaching. They have a kind of like a little small studio they train with and a couple other trainers. They share the studio. So they're doing more one-on-one stuff, but they're bringing in this programming mindset or knowledge of this is what I did for my classes. This is what I'm going to do for each individual client. The problem they're running into is, is is what you miss when you do large group classes is that everybody's different. <laughs> so one of their clients is brand new to lifting, uh, has never touched a dumbbell or barbell before, didn't, doesn't even know what the difference was between a barbell and a dumbbell. Then the other one they said is a trainer where um, they like the trainer I work with is training this trainer <laughs> and that trainer, their client used to do group training before in like, um, kind of like a commercial gym setting, very low, like low difficulty of things, but she had moved around the gym and did some things. She has a strong lower body cause she was a college athlete. Um, but she specifically wants to build her glutes and her shoulder. She feels like those are two areas that are lagging in her body parts. So my client, has those two clients, a brand new lifter, and then uh, a former trainer that's kind of been through the block a little bit, knows some things, but really wants to build her glutes and her shoulders. What we were talking about was the trainer I coach, um, they were saying that they could feel a disconnect between what they know to do versus what they felt was right. So they have each person going through a similar upper body workout structure. And I'll talk more about lower body too, but um, the workout structure is a chest press and a row, back row, paired together. So you do a set of the chest press, a set of the row, a set of the chest press, a set of the row. Then they do a circuit with shoulders, triceps, and biceps. Now their training sessions are 30 minutes. The person spends 20 minutes doing like a cardiovascular kind of um, uh like hit high intensity interval training and then they do 20 minutes with the trainer so it kind of like cycles and rotates through it's uh it it works it's not yeah yeah so um the chest presses and rows 
they can do and get done in about 10 to 12 minutes. And then the shoulders, tries and buys, they kind of cycle quickly through in about like eight minutes or so. Now, if people, assuming they're still going out and training on their own other times of the week, you know, a 20 minute workout with 10 minutes of it being like 10 minutes additional of high intensity interval training, it's a, it's a good workout because the trainer can teach the person new movements. So maybe they can only teach one or two new movements per session because you don't have a lot of time to teach. But you can definitely learn new movements. You can get technique corrections. The person can then take this information and go do in their own workouts. Also, the 30 minutes is something they can easily do during a lunch hour. Uh, The trainer I work with who has this structure, they live in like a major city. So this is very big, big, big for them. People have to get in, get out, get in, get out. Uh, So they have a huge rush in the beginning of the day. They have a huge rush in the middle of the day. Then they have a rush after work. Now, this structure does work. It it makes a ton of money and it works very well for both the trainer and the person. So you can funnel people through. So for example, the trainer sees three people per hour because it's 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes while the people are cycling through in the cardio. So in two hours, you can train six people. You can get through a good amount of people, which allows the individual cost per person uh, to not have to be too much, but the trainer's earnings get to be a decent amount. So it's a good structure. It makes sense. All the good stuff. Now, the problem is, is that format of like presses and rows paired together, then shoulders, tries and buys paired together. It doesn't necessarily uh, like kind of work best for each individual person. So for example, the new lifter, they could benefit from more compound movements. So they don't really need to do bicep and tricep isolations and shoulder raise isolations because they're not strong. So they might be doing lateral raises with like five pound or eight pound dumbbells. It's not really going to cause any significant at all muscle damage. And it's not going to cause a lot of muscle um, like annoyance, which would create like kind of a stimulation for for shape changing growth uh, because the volume is just too low. So they're they're too, too weak to do something strong enough and short. Uh, So they would need to do it since they're too weak to do something heavy. They have to do what they can do, but they have to do a lot of sets of it if they're going to do isolations, but they don't have the time to do isolations. So the problem is, is they're getting good weight load stimulus on the presses and rows, the compound movements. There's, you know, great technique they can, can work that can move towards all other types of presses and rows. Uh, so there's like foundational components of technique that, you know, if you do a chest press at a 15 degree incline, what you learn there can work for a 15 degree uh, decline, a flat, 30 degree incline, 45 degree incline. You know, if you do a, 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 a row with dumbbells, uh, that kind of mechanics, the technique of that carries over to pretty much any row. So they're getting a lot of benefit for technique. They're getting a lot of stabilizational muscles built as, lo- as well as their strong, big muscles that we want to continue to get bigger and stronger. Uh, and they're getting as much muscle stimulus as possible. So a chest press is going to work on their chest, the front of their shoulders, and their triceps. Uh, You know, the row, as we said, is going to work on their back muscles, the back of their shoulders, and their biceps. So the more compound movements the new person does, the more benefits they get. However, with the experienced lifter, if you do compound movements, everything grows equally, but that's actually not even true. Um, Your strongest things grow first, the weakest things grow second. So the imbalance that the experienced lifter is already feeling between their glutes and their shoulders is just going to continue. So every time they do a lower body movement, if they don't naturally use their glutes well, they like say they're thigh dominant, uh, they're going to just continue that. So you have to break away from compound movements and get to isolations because you want to change the specific muscle compared to other muscles. Therefore, you have to make sure the stimulus of the exercises you do go to the exact muscle you want, not the other muscles. You know, so if I have muscles A, B, C, and I want muscle A to grow, and I do an exercise that involves A, B, C, I'm just going to get growth over A, B, C. If I only want A to grow, I have to do an exercise that only uses A, right? So, two podcasts that I think would be helpful to listen to is podcast 1219. It's a Q&A podcast titled, Can You Change the Shape of Muscles? The answer is yes. <laughs> it's going to be a ton of good information in there. 
podcast 383 is a training podcast titled How Your Strength Affects How You Should Train. And this is a huge thing about what we're talking about today. So that's podcast 383. Those are great podcasts for you to get some base information to know kind of more about what I'm talking about today and how you'd make the corrections and changes. So for example, for the new lifter, they would be better off doing the chest press in the back row and then going to an overhead press and a pull down. Why? Because the chest press and the overhead press are going to work the chest, the shoulders, and the triceps. The back row is going to work the back, the back of the shoulders and the biceps. So they're going to get everything they wanted in the previous workout, which was chest presses and rows, and then shoulders, tries, and bys. They're going to get all of that, but they're going to be able to get more stimulus because they're going to get heavier weight loads. So the biceps are going to be trained twice still. Triceps are going to be trained twice still. So you're still going to get, um, you know, the biceps, triceps, the shoulders. You're still going to get everything, but you're going to get it with much heavier weight loads. And that's going to get more muscle um, kind of damage and more stimulus for change. Since they're weaker, they need heavier, bigger movements. So that's the compound movements. So rather than doing a, a chest press and a row superset followed by a circuit of shoulders, tries, and buys, it's better for them to do the chest press and the row circuit followed by a overhead press and a pull down. The other benefit is, is that changes the angles. So chest press and back row, you could argue are kind of like um, they go perpendicular with the body and overhead presses and pull downs go parallel with the body. So you're kind of changing uh, the angle of push and pull from the joints that you're using and that's going to help just develop more muscle tissue as well because you're changing angles and changing the stimulus in the muscles. Whereas for the experienced lifter, you might be better off doing an isolation compound isolation sequence. So what this could mean is like for shoulders, you might do raises, presses, and then raises. So you do an isolation, a compound, and an isolation. For glutes, you might do some type of hinge-based work, which reduces thigh involvement down by the knee. Uh, then you do a squat and deadlift, and then you do more hinge work. So in our gym, like we have a machine abductor, which is the one where you push apart and that uses like the lower part of the out, lower outer part of the glutes. We have that next to our Nautilus glute drive, which is a hip thrust machine. So I have clients to superset that back and forth. Then you can have them do split squats and dumbbell RDLs. That would be a great way to blend together isolative glute work, plus you're getting a little bit of thighs involved, but it's still way more glutes than it would be th uh, hamstrings and quadriceps. So sequencing these things a little bit different per client would be very helpful. So this person, the way they kind of do their structures with their clients is they do upper body workouts once a week, lower body workouts once a week. Now you can switch to also doing full body both times, which I would recommend uh, because again you're going to get more volume more stimulus more damage so there's a couple other changes and some other things we did uh, that I helped this uh, my client write workout programs and structures so now they have options they have full body options they have upper lower options they have new lifter options experience lifter options you know isolative work options we now have way 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 more examples uh, and like formats that this trainer now can pull from so they're going to start getting better and better results for their clients that's going to build word of mouth it's going to build their business and then the clients get better results and they're happier as well so it's neat how just knowing the difference between the the difference between and the pros and cons of compound movements versus isolation movements it helps you kind of be better at selecting which ones do I need for which purpose do I have <laughs> you know um, everybody's a little bit different there isn't like one structure of workouts that fits everyone you know can can everyone do one structure sure <laughs> that doesn't mean it's the best structure so I can write a workout format and have everyone I ever work with do that and they're going to get some results sure but are they going to get the best results no you know, people have different starting points. They have different outcomes, different goals. You know, maybe both people want to look, you know, good in a bathing suit, but one person's starting from no muscle and kind of skinny fat. The other one's starting from being, you know, 50 pounds, 60 pounds overweight, but maybe they have relatively thick legs because they're carrying around heavier weight. You're going to train those two people very differently, even if they have the exact same end goal outcome. Okay.
So I thought this would be kind of neat just to hear some of the stuff that I get to talk through with clients. I love these kind of things. Love it, love it, love it. Uh, but it's kind of neat how uh, we talked about like the podcasts that I think would help is, you know, can you change the shape of muscles? Absolutely. So picking exercises to get the changes that you want specifically is very helpful. And then how your strength affects how you should train, which is podcast 383. It's helpful to know that, okay, if I'm stronger I do have to train differently than somebody who's weaker, or if I'm weaker, I have to train somebody differently than somebody who's stronger. So a lot of times you'll see, you know, somebody might start into lifting or they're only a year or two in or maybe even three in, and they look at this professional who does these crazy things and they're like, I want to do that too, so they train like that person does. No! <laughs> You're very different strength levels. You absolutely should train differently. Um, so podcast 1219 and podcast 383 will help. Also, if you want to, there's a podcast 1160, which is a training podcast titled Using pre exhaust to change exercise focus and that helps you better understand the sequencing for example uh, like why we would do abductor and glute drive which are glute specific work before the split squats because if you pre-exhaust the glutes before you go to a split squat you're going to get more glute stimulus out of the split squats so all of a sudden your split squats are more glute building now than they ever were before so you can actually change the benefit of a second exercise by what you do first so that's really cool, and it's a fun way to kind of get a different outcome out of things you already know how to do. If you just change the sequence around, you can get really cool results. Uh, cool. Okay. Well, I hope that was uh, interesting and a lot of fun. If you have any questions, always reach out. Our email is brutalironjim at gmail.com. I really appreciate the opportunity to have these fun conversations. So thank you for all my clients. I really enjoy getting to work with you and getting to be a part of your journey and your clients' uh, journeys. Awesome. Okay. Well, if you like today's podcast or the podcast in general, please consider sharing the podcast. You can do so on social media that reaches the most amount of people. You can also just share in a conversation. The more people that know of the podcast, the more people that can benefit from the podcast. Cool. Well, uh, we also have patrons of the podcast. So thank you to those who donate to the podcast. The podcast is well over $1,000 a year for hosting costs. I really appreciate the financial support. Uh, you know, helps make more sense to me give an hour to this every day. I love it. I love it. I love it. So thank you for all of your support so we can continue to do this. If you want to give support to the podcast, you can do so at our website, www.brutalironjim.com. There's an option for one-time monthly and yearly donations. Also, if you like the information we share in a podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Gym. If you have any questions, feedback, suggestions, anything you want to know, let us know at our email, brutalironjim at gmail.com. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.